Okay. All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still on a somewhat staggered return, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, season six, intriguing interviews with creative minds. With so many writers out there looking to place genre fiction stories, <coughs> stories and novels, including sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, and lots of fans out there who want to read those stories, I thought it would be a good time to have some real talk with some small and indie publishers to tell us what they're up to in this crazy COVID world of ours. On our panel tonight is David Niall Wilson, a Stoker award-winning author and CEO and founder of Crossroads Press, a cutting edge digital publishing company specializing in electronic novels, collections and nonfiction, as well as unabridged audiobooks and print titles. Welcome, David. Glad to have, glad for you to have me. <laughs> that worked out great. <laughs> All right. Also on our panel is John M. McElveen. He is the author of the best selling and Stoker Award nominated paranormal suspense novel, Hannaware, and is CEO of Haverville House Publishing LLC. Welcome, John. Glad to be here. All right. And rounding out our panel is Chris Kennedy. He is a Webster Award winning author and three time Dragon Award finalist and runs Chris Kennedy Publishing. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Russ. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, fair enough. All right, a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send me notes or questions you have for the panel in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. All right, so just so we're clear for the audience, please just take a minute and we'll go one by one. And I want, to, want you to let us know about your particular publishing company. You know, what kinds of books are you looking for? What, do you, what kind of stuff do you publish? And what are you looking for from authors? And we'll start with John. Um, yeah, I... I run Haverhill House Publishing, um, one of those towns in Massachusetts that's hard to pronounce. Uh, um, uh, we have three imprints, well, actually four, if you include Haverhill House, uh, Twisted Publishing, uh, which is primarily horror. Um, then we have Yap, which is young adult publishing, and uh, Yap Junior, which is for smaller grade school and younger. Um, <clears throat> uh, over the past, few years, uh, let's say three years, um, we've slowed down a lot because of yes, COVID, uh, but also we had a house fire that took us out of commission for about two years for the most part. I was still able to publish a few things, but um, uh, we are primarily horror, but we do deviate once in a while um, and we are moving a few more young adult uh, novels that are coming out in the next year or so. Um, but we have published um, a couple science books uh, from the Wilhelm Reich Museum, um, a couple mainstream novels. So we do uh, expand outward, but um, primarily we are horror. All right. Um, so if it's something, uh, I, I try to find things that aren't, um, what do you call it, tro tropes or, you know, the common, I like things that are unusual. So um, if you have something that doesn't uh, fall into the lines with, uh, say, werewolves and ghosts, I'm, I'm looking for something a little different. All right, fair enough. All right, Chris, what do you got? Hey, um, Chris Kennedy Publishing publishes about 70 books a year, um, so a little bit better than one, uh, one a week. Um, got uh, nine imprints, uh, currently using uh, seven of them uh, pretty heavily. Um, by and large, it's science fiction and fantasy. Uh, also do a little bit of uh, post APOC. Um, the the main you know the main imprints are are mostly sci-fi, um, although we are growing fantasy a lot this year. So when you say sci-fi, obviously sci-fi is pretty broad. Do you kind of do more hard sci-fi, soft, a combination of all? Um, we we do a little bit of of each of the different things. Um, our our bread and butter is mill sci-fi um, with. Um, our, our main series being the Four Horsemen universe, uh, which is a, uh, a shared universe that has 77 books in it right now. All right, David. Um, well, Crossroad Press started out um, oddly and continued that way. We've got nine imprints, I think, nine or 10, and uh, started out just doing my books and then every... Hey guys, I, 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 hate to, I hate to do this. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue. Um, the uh, attendees are having a tough time getting in. So here's what we're going to have to do. And I really hate doing this. Um, I'm going to have to just put us on pause for a minute 
and uh, and just kind of rectify some issues. So just bear with me, okay? All right. All right. Sorry about that, folks. We had some technical glitches. It happens. Hey, even on that's what happens on the roller coaster. Sometimes uh, best laid plans, as they say. So uh, we did a quick intro on um, on some of the uh, ventures. So David was about to tell us. Uh, just kind of give us an update on uh, what kind of books you're publishing and what you're looking for from authors. Well, we are not and have never been per se open for submissions. We started out bringing back backlist books from people that were already, you know, published commercially. Every once in a while something slides in, but it's usually, you know, almost accidental because there's only two of us really that work full time. And then my wife is an editor and, you know, we, we're probably backlogged right now a couple hundred books. But, uh, All right, fair enough. All right, so let me, let's see, uh, where are we? Okay, so um, so as a follow-up, so you've told us what you want, what's absolutely just not for you, no matter how well it might be written. Um, and so we'll kind of stick with, so we'll go back to John. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of, um, of, of <laughs> like romances. Um, uh, there's not uh, a lot of, you know, no. definitely push away. Um, uh, what is a, uh, there's a paranormal romance <laughs> as um, something I, I just, it doesn't appeal to me. Uh, I know a lot of people love it and they have that right, but um, it's just something that's about it. And a hard sci-fi, um, they can send that to Chris. <laughs> because, uh, uh, it's again it's not in my you know my belly whack no all right chris what about you so you know you you focus predominantly sci-fi a little bit of fantasy but what's yeah we do sci-fi fantasy and uh and some post apoc um if it's not one of those i'm i'm probably not interested um you know all of our all of our stuff typically also is uh, very message free um, we're, we're looking for good stories that entertain people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, life, life is hard enough as it is, especially these days. Um, we're looking for good stories that take people other places and give them some escapism. All right. Fair enough. Uh, all right. So, um, so when you, first and foremost, when you engage with writers or they engage with you, what are you looking um, from them? Like what's most important to you? in the engagement process. So John. Um, well, I, good writing. Um, a writer who tells a hell of a good story. And um, one thing that really does put me off is um, poor editing. Uh, it can really take you, it could be an excellent storyline, but poor editing can really knock you out of it. And, uh, I don't know if that's the what you you were asking there. Um, so the the um, I feel I've been fortunate. Um, I don't publish a lot. Um, I I just can't even wrap my head around how much Chris, both Chris and uh, Dave publish. But um, I, I usually know it um, within the first three or four chapters of reading that I have something good here. Okay, and Chris, what about you? Oh yeah, definitely. You want something at the start that that catches your attention and and really hooks you in. Um, the we we tend to do a lot of open anthologies over the year, um, and the the one thing that really gets um, people booted out fast is not following the rules. You know, typically the the anthologies only have four or five rules. You know, do this, do this, do this, do this, and and if you can't do those four little things. You're probably not somebody that I want to publish because you're probably not going to turn in stuff on time. You're probably not going to follow other rules. Um, you're, you're going to make my life hard. And, and, you know, if I'm publishing 70 books a year, I don't need somebody to make my life hard. My life's hard enough already. Um, so I want I want folks that are going to, you know, follow follow rules um, and, and meet meet their commitments. If they say they're going to turn something in on January 1st. I want it by January 1st because I've got things set up, you know, to, to meet those dates. All right. So let me ask you this. So it's a little bit of a follow-up. And so what are your biggest 
unbreakable no-nos? Me personally, my, yeah. my unbreakable no-nos? Um, gosh, uh, you know, if I tell you it, I want it between, you know, this word count and it's not between this word count, um, thank you very much. I uh, hope you find a great place for it somewhere else. John? Yeah. John? Oh, me? Uh, biggest no, plagiarism would uh, definitely be one. Um, <laughs> That would rank at the top, I think. Uh, I, that one, that one kind of went without saying. I yeah, think. I know. <laughs> That's, you, you give me something from somebody else, uh, we're gonna have other issues. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, you're, you're definitely right there. Uh, people who uh, will try to, uh, you know, catch you with fancy fonts and colored print, and that uh, I want simple black and white New York Times or. Uh, a, sim a simple font like that. Um, it, it still blows my mind that people will try to put a, a fancy font on their writing, which really makes it difficult to write. So I just send it back. All right. So you, you mentioned it before, and it's, it's impossible, I think, to have a conversation about publishing without sort of getting into a little bit about the pandemic. It disrupted all of our lives in various ways. So in what specific ways has the pandemic impacted your publishing ventures and how or, or how or have you adapted, uh, David? Um, the pandemic for us was actually fairly profitable because, I mean, my family is pretty, pretty reclusive anyway. We don't go out a lot. And, and, and as um, Mr. Kennedy can attest, there's nothing to do if you do go out. So <laughs> we do all of our publishing. My, my business partner is in Atlanta and we're online every night. We do. We might get 300 titles this year. Um, audiobooks were really big during the pandemic. So what we tried to do was just catch up and to be really helpful for the authors. I know as an author, I had a lot of trouble during the pandemic. And I think a lot of people did. So we worked with what we had going already. And we, we just pushed to get as much out there as we could. Because I know that, you know, the sales and everything helped people who couldn't get into work. And so it, it was a really busy time for us. So the pandemic helped you. So you were behind it, knew it. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, what, Chris, what about you? Um, yeah, we, we definitely experienced uh, some, some writing things, like David said. Uh, I know my personal productivity was down. I think we were down, uh, you know, just about every author um, that, you know, I, I published was down, uh, which gave some opportunity to some new folks. Um, I went and found some new folks, some folks that had um, published some things, but but hadn't really uh, gotten the attention that it deserved and, and re-released a couple of those. Um, we definitely went to audio hard um, here this past year. Um, I think that's, that's definitely something that uh, really is uh, going up. Um, and, and I think that, you know, just by, by keeping up with um, everything we were doing. We didn't, we didn't allow it to, uh, to put a pause on us. Um, we were able to fight through the, the pandemic and, and actually uh, the last two months have been the, the best two months in CKP's history. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're really uh, fighting through it and, and coming out well at the end. Nice. Nice. John, how about you? Uh, yeah, it did kind of strike us uh, extra hard um, where I, I, my publishing is uh, part time. I work primarily for as a. I run the uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory radar facilities in Westford, and so we had to deal, of course, at work with a lot of issues. Um, people working from home, uh, uh, dealing with, you know, being what we are, the radar site. People coming on site, and, um, so that that took up a lot of the. Uh, so the extra time I had to publish. Um, as far as the publishing goes, um, I'm not so much an online publisher as um, I like to attend the conventions and um, be on site with the authors and the conventions were, um, you know, Nikon uh, is one of the conventions. I'm, I'm one of the coordinators at uh, Nikon and that hasn't happened. We're going in the third year of that. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, probably privately, that um, 
our house burnt down on March 3rd, March 7th on uh, 2020. So oh, we yeah. were basically, it, it was um, it was a total loss as far as the house goes. So we had to find somewhere else to live, the business. So it was really a, a couple rough years. Oh, jeez. Are you uh, are you okay now? Are you, are you bouncing yeah, back? Yeah, we're out? back in the house. But it, it was just very hard uh, uh, with COVID. You know, um, no one is comfortable working. Um, we couldn't get another home to, you know, the insurance gives you a home to equal or better than your lifestyle. Yeah, that didn't happen because no one was renting. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I had a... I looked at the same time as you, I had, I had a huge flood and this whole, this whole basement is completely redone and the insurance company, they stuck it to me good. Yeah. Our solar panels caught on fire. So it went from the top down. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to uh, throw in um, just one more thing. I, sure. You know, I, I definitely agree with John. Our, our business model um, in the past has typically been to uh, do a lot of cons and, and all of our readers really get out and, and go to the local cons where they are. Uh, there are several that, that we all tend to do together um, and, and not having those really drop sales in the middle mm -hmm. until we got, you know, some extra advertising in there and, and really um, had, to, had to hit the marketing a lot harder to, to kind of reco recover from the loss from, you know, not having cons. So that, that was definitely a, a big driver for us for a while. Um, that we finally were able to work through. Right, right. So um, you had mentioned Chris a little bit, and it was I think it's a good transition. So many writers that I know, and I'm sure you do as too, complain that publishers keep going back to the well with the same authors getting preferential treatment, uh, repeatedly, repeatedly published while newer authors are, are often left tapping on the glass on the outside looking in. Uh, what's your attitude about an appetite for working with writers you've never published before. I love it. Um, absolutely. Like I said, we do a lot of anthologies. Um, every single anthology, well, I can't, I guess I can't say every single, but uh, 90 some percent um, have room for uh, new authors. We always, typically we, we'll do uh, 14 stories in an anthology and at least four of them will be for new authors. Uh, either never published or, you know, only have just a, you know, a story or two. Um, love working with new authors, love getting them in there. Um, you know, everybody's a new author at some point. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have somebody include me into an anthology when, you know, when I was starting out and, and probably didn't deserve it. Um, so I want to make sure I pass that on, you know, and do everything I can to, to help folks that are starting out now. Um, and, and we've been really successful with that. You know, we've, we've found some great stories by doing that. Um, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the, the next full length story that I'm, uh, that I'm working on now editing, uh, was from somebody that started out doing a couple short stories. They won into the anthologies and, and I said, that's great. You're, you're doing great with short stories. I need more. You need to write a full length book. Uh, matter of fact, you need to make it a trilogy. So, you know, come on, let's go. Right on. All right. So John, what about you? Um, well, uh, you know, I've, I've got, uh, of course, uh, I, I publish a lot for Chris Golden. So he's, he's pretty much, uh, uh, you know, a fixture in the, uh, horror, um, community. Um, but most of the people outside of Chris, I, I, want to, I, I would say our first time authors, at least um, for novels, the novels I published. Uh, an interesting thing we did is um, a book called The Twisted Book of Shadows, which was purely blind submission. We had um, Matt Bechtel go uh, taking the names and all identifying factors off all the stories of over 700 stories submitted. And um, it was amazing. I think that collection was probably, you know, 90% um, or 80 to 90% authors I've never heard of before. And it was really a fantastic collection and won the Shirley Jackson Award. So yeah, um, new authors have been very, uh, very good. 
So, so David, you have a different, a little bit of a different model. So what, what's your, how do you decide how to work with, and just to kind of recap for the folks who missed at the beginning, how do you get authors into your pipeline? We, we end up getting people from all kinds of different ways. I mean, we start, like I said, we started out with people that were just backlist. We've got people like Irving Wallace and we got all his old books and Clyde Barker's audio books. And, it, but along the way, what happens is we'll meet people or one of our other authors knows another author that has a book that hasn't been published yet. We've, we've actually dealt with quite a few new authors over time, but we don't seek them necessarily. And then when we do find them, we have to, we have to vet it pretty carefully just because of the amount of time that we have available. It is, it is a lot more work to work with a new author than it is with somebody who's very established, but sometimes you just never know what you're going to get. And uh, we did a book by a Chicago detective and he died. He didn't finish it, but his daughter got it finished, um, Sarge. And that's been a huge seller for us. And it's a really interesting book. And uh, we wouldn't have found it except for one of our authors had her as an agent and she had the book. And you know, it's just more word of mouth for us on that kind of thing. We've done 3,000 books, so <laughs> <laughs> we're closer to 300 a year than. than All right, so. right it's good effort. Very good yeah, effort. Yeah, it's a lot of work. All right, so the larger publishers have contracted significantly over the years. And we've all heard horror stories about, or lived through it personally, <laughs> um, uh, authors who have had their work ignored, dropped, or even buried for all sorts of reasons. And even worse, um, stories about trying to get their rights back. So for the re these reasons and more, many writers have over the years been seeking out al uh, alternative publishing options. When working with authors, what can they expect from you as the publisher and what do you expect from them? Uh, so David, why don't we just keep going with you? So I was gonna start before I answer that exactly. I, I wanna answer something that you just said. Um, sure. One of the things that we have become very good at and one of the things that we fight very hard at is to get rights back for authors. And we've done that a bunch of them. We're getting ready to get, we just got back the rights to the first book in a series that they didn't take the second book for. And it takes, you know, it can take forever to get them to give that up, even though they have no intention of doing anything with it. So that our authors can expect that we're going to, um, we're going to do anything we can to make them as happy as possible. We've never been late on a payment, on a royalty payment. We've never been in the red. Um, we're honest. And we expect pretty much the same from them and a little bit of patience. <laughs> That's the one thing I say, when, especially when you're working with a newer author, they don't really know what to expect. They don't know when they've asked a question, you know, more times maybe than they should have. Um, but we try to be patient with all that. And, and really it's, it's just, it's just a huge, I, I don't even know how it stays together to be honest. So, so John, what about you? Um, well, uh, I haven't had much problem. Um, well, I, I, I have a very different model than Dave, I guess, but uh, Dave, I, I wish I could, um, I think working, Full time and not being able to publish full time, I, I can't be as um, on top of it as David is. Um, uh, I haven't had to deal with pulling, you know, freeing someone else's rights. Um, especially a lot of them are being first time publishers. I have a an agreement. Um, I think Dave has pretty much the same thing that if they want to pull their title, um, you know they can, you know, there's a couple of things, you know, we got to, um, you know, uh, with a couple, um, you know, we got to finish off the, their title, sell off what uh, we have, but um, we will give them back their rights. All right. So that, that's on the rights part of it. So I'm, let's focus on, so you're the publisher, right? The author says, I you come to you, you make a deal. You say, great. We love it. So some, some publishers, say, great, I have your book. I printed it or it's, it's ready and they literally do nothing. It just dies on the vine. Some do more, some do less. What can an author who works with you, John, what can they expect from you in terms of ongoing support? And then what do you expect from them? Um, well, I, I, I have the understanding with them that we're promoting the book is up to both of us um, being as I said, um, I'm, I, I wish I could speak as a full-time publisher um, to be able to give the, uh, 
you know, more of a, a coherent answer, I guess. Um, we've been very fortunate. Um, we have a lot of uh, connections that share what we promote and, you know, what we publish. And I'm not sure if I'm getting your question right, but. Um, <laughs> well, if, I mean, for example, I mean, you know, you can say, you know, we we're going to promote your book, but promote it how? Like, what do you do and how how often do you do it? What do you expect from them in return? I mean, you could just say, hey, we, we put out we put out a post on Facebook. To me, that's not promoting. That's that's yeah. nothing. All right. You got to do. I mean, I personally. I would want a whole lot more than that, but not everyone, not every publisher does that. So what, what can an author expect from you? Um, to promote as much as possible. I do on uh, Instagram and on Facebook. I, I don't, I'm not financially set up to be a, you know, to, um, to put big ads in magazines. Um, <clears throat> You know, well, you, you also talked about doing a lot of conventions. So like, what, we do, what, yes, we do a lot of conventions when, when conventions are around, it's been right. tough, you know, with uh, the way it's been, I do pop ads. Uh, we have a couple of smaller magazines and, uh, um, and of course the HWA helps out a lot with advertising with them. Okay. And Chris, what about you? So what sure, do you we do? A, we do a number of different things. Um, you know, obviously we, we promote on social media. Um, the, the good thing about CKP or Chris Kennedy publishing is that, um, all of the authors help promote each other. Um, it's, it's very much a, a team kind of thing. So, you know, when, when one book launches, everybody's talking about it. So it gets it, you know, out there a ways, um, by the time folks have, uh, you know, third or fourth book out, you know, definitely looking at running uh, Facebook and Amazon ads on them. Um, get you know, definitely getting out to uh, conventions and discussing them there. Um, you know, variety of different things. As far as what I'm expecting, um, you know, I'm I'm definitely expecting the authors to do their part and and at least talk about and sound excited about their books. You know, the the fastest thing to to get me to drop your series is your book comes out and you say nothing, you don't even, you know, you can't even be bothered to put out a single Facebook post on it. Um, what I would like to see is, you know, authors with, uh, you know, developing some sort of platform for themselves to, mm -hmm. to grow their, to grow their popularity um, with, uh, you know, definitely a, a website with a mailing list, um, I think is a, a great start to becoming a professional author. Uh, also, uh, off offering wider distribution, not just uh, popping it out on Amazon, but, um, you know, uh, there's Smashwords, there's Barnes & Noble, there's, you know, a number to reach out a little further. Um, to be, you know, candid, I'm, I've only been in the doing this for about four years. So I'm learning, um, especially by watching other people and I'm, I'm getting my sea legs here. <laughs> yeah. For, for like us, uh, science fiction fantasy, typically Kindle Unlimited is going to be where we make about two thirds of our money. So we're not looking to go wide, you know, as, as we start out, you know, maybe down the road, um, you know, once things kind of dry up there, but, but definitely looking to hit KU hard early. I'd, I'd like to cut back in on that because I don't yeah, think please. I answered your question. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, um, when we have a new book, when it's an original book and not one of the reprints that we do, um, we try to get that out at least not, you know, put the publishing date out at least 90 days. We send it to publishers weekly. We try to get a, a book bub new release advertisement for it if possible. Um, and we do do the wider distribution. We, we publish all of our print on Amazon, but for Amazon, we just, we don't let them distribute to anybody else. And then we publish also on Lightning Source and uh, pay that little fee to get into the Ingram catalog. So when, when it's a new new book with us, they can expect a really good push at the beginning um, and a continued effort, hopefully for things like BookBub and uh, a lot of social media stuff down the road. It's just that there's so many. Yeah. That's why we concentrate on the new ones. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know what the secret um, uh, potion is to get in BookBub, but I've tried <laughs> it for times and they're just very, um, 
It's hard. I don't know how you did it, Dave, with me getting in there twice, but <laughs> I, I've, they've, they've knocked me down every time. All right. All right. Except so, so a quick interlude for the folks that came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for the panel, send them the chat box and we'll get to a few at the end of the show. All right. So I'm guessing that you guys uh, get more submissions than you can probably keep up with. <laughs> so what can you tell us about um, what authors should do? if they feel that they're being ignored or in their minds unfairly passed over. So John, why don't we stick with you? Um, well, I, I do have a gigantic um, log. Um, what do you call it? A backlog of things to be read. I've got a few readers um, who know what I'm looking for. Um, as far as uh you know, I ask them to be patient because uh, there is just myself and a couple other people working with me um, as they are able. Um, as I said, it's not a full-time endeavor. So, uh, um, but I always tell them, if you think you have something really good, uh, send it to the big five first. Then if they don't accept it, come see me um, because I'll never be able to get the distribution that Doubleday has or you know, or Putnam or anything like that. But, um, uh, you know, send me an email uh, a couple months after you send it to see how it's doing. Um, you know, I will answer them. <laughs> I know, you know, um, but um, I ask them to be patient because um, we are very small. We're a very small publishing um, house. And All right. All right. Fair, fair enough. All right, Chris, what about you? I, I think the best way um, is to see me at a con. Um, you know, if you've got something that's that's great, um, you know, try and figure out where I'm going to be or one of my authors, um, because we typically work on uh, on word of mouth. Um, you know, we want folks that are going to fit in well with the team. So the best way is to come and, and talk with us and see if we're the right place for you. Um, if so, and, and you come up and see me at a, at a con and so I know who you are, you know, send it to me and I'm, I'm definitely going to give it, you know, uh, I, I will give it a read. Um, I will, uh, I can probably, like uh, John said earlier, I can probably tell within the first few chapters whether I'm going to publish it or not. Um, and, and if the answer is no, I probably won't read it all the way through, but I'll definitely give it a read. Um, and I'll definitely give you some feedback on it, um, why it wasn't for us and, and what, you know, maybe you could do next time to make it where it is for us. Right on. All right. David? We, we get a lot of submissions, even though we're not really open for submissions. So <laughs> when, we get, when we get projects in, um, I try to turn it around immediately. If it's, if it's something that I know that we just don't have time for, then I, you know, I try to be helpful. I try to give them some suggestions where to send it. But explain that, you know, we just aren't going to be able to do it. Um, we try just to get rid of everything in the inbox before it gets old, because it's just too easy to fall behind. And one of the things that I hated about traditional publishing, you mentioned that earlier, was sending stuff in and waiting forever and then finding mm -hmm. out that they either lost it or don't remember what you're talking about and where the editor has gone and not even there anymore. It happened to me so many times. Yep. So we don't want to be that person. Right. And John, I have a day job. <laughs> yeah, you, you you're amazing then i don't know you must you must have clones um <laughs> all right, all right so, uh, one other thing i'd like to add quickly is um uh, don't say if you send in a manuscript don't say this is the first of a nine book series <laughs> <laughs> that believe it or not that happens quite often yep. and so I, that that's a good way for me to say yeah that's not for me <laughs> All right. So as you guys look ahead to the next year or so, what are you hoping to accomplish with each of your respective uh, publishing ventures? So, John, let's keep going with you. Um, I'm looking to get back on track. Um, as I said, it's, it's been I'm hoping this COVID thing is, is going to finally come to an end and we can uh, start moving forward again. Um, uh, it, just to get moving again um we've been we've been on rusty tracks for a few years and uh, i feel we're going in the right direction we got a few new books that uh we're feeling very good about coming out um um 
uh, uh, Dave Surface and Julia Rust have a YA that's coming out from us. I've, I've been trying to tell them to go under the name Surface Rust, but they don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but so yeah, we it, we're looking forward. Um, I've got a number of um, a number of books lined up. So All right. good, uh, Chris. What about you? Well, we are uh, going to continue to grow our audio books. Um, we're looking to continue doing what we're doing in science fiction fantasy. We're growing the fantasy label. Um, we're also breaking out overseas into uh, foreign language markets. Uh, we have, uh, in the last two months, put out six books in Germany, uh, in German. Uh, we're going to continue that. Uh, we're also going to move into some other languages here over the course of this year. Um, some of our better performing series we're getting over there and uh, we've had great, you know, great success so far. So we want to continue to grow that as well. Okay. David? Um, we are going to be doing some major reorganizing. We're going to be moving from our, our way too complex website to a Wix site where we can, you know, get, make sure that all the author, authors have visibility more than they do now. We, we started out way too ambitious on the website and it, it was a mind crusher. So we're going to get with that. We're going to try to reorganize and check out some of the newer advertising things coming along. Um, do a little bit more visual advertising. I don't, if you guys have probably noticed some of those popping up from us on Twitter, um, trying to be a little bit more graphic oriented and, and have a little bit more eye-catching things and to do more. I mean, the originals are what, what lately have really been killing for us. We had two originals come out in December and, and January that are just absolutely killing it. Great. Mm. That's excellent. All right, guys, that was great. But now it's time for a special segment where we spin the wheel on the wheel are seven possible categories. Wherever it lands is what you get. And the categories are quantum leap, star swap, creature feature, stranger in a strange land, music lover, desperately dreaming Dexter and kick him in the junk. All right, John. <laughs> I know which one I'm probably getting. <laughs> All right, John, you're up first. You ready? Yeah. All right, let's see. Round and round. All right. And you got... All right, Quantum Leap. All right, you volunteer to step into the Quantum Leap Accelerator, only you get to pick where you go and when within your own lifetime. What's your destination? Holy crap. <laughs> um, I don't know how courageous I would be. I, I'd like to say I'd like to be one of the people that travel to Mars to do a, uh, <laughs> see if we can survive there a while, but um, uh, man. That's a tough one. Um, probably the yeah. I, I'd say if I if, to if I was younger, I would go to Mars. <laughs> well, but remember, this has to be within your own lifetime. So any well, point, that, any point in the in, in your history, where would you go? Any in my history? Yeah, in your lifetime. I like where I am now, believe it or not. <laughs> and I know that's uh, kind of a letdown, but uh, my past hasn't been the greatest, so I'm not going that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, fair enough. Right go, go, with, go with what you know, as they say. Yeah, yeah, that's it. All right, David, you're up next. All right, what do you got? And for you, we got Star Swap. All right, this is a new. This is this is a this is a new one for us. Uh, Star Wars and Star Trek are both in the midst of a TV renaissance. Pick one character from each franchise and drop them into the other, on one show in particular. Um, Captain Picard and Han Solo. So Picard, so Picard's in the Millennium Falcon. Yes, and Han Solo, and Han Solo to, is, is, is running the Enterprise. Yes, and I want to know, the thing I want to know is when Han Solo does this, what does he say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. May the, force, may the force be with you. Yeah, right. All right, all right, Chris, you're up. You ready? All right. Hit all right. me. All right, what do we got? And we got a right, music lover. Okay, so. Uh, what song or piece of music do you love, no matter how many times you hear it? I can feel it in the air tonight. Oh, uh, and I'm going to get that drum solo every time. All right. That's right. Well, speaking speaking to a, to a drummer, I appreciate it. Hey, Thomas. All right. There you go. All right. So hold on. I have to get my... Uh, my special cards. What did I do here? Of course, I, I'm a little disorganized today, which is not like me, but all right, you know what? I'll, I'll wing it. All right. So 
We have three options for our next, our next section is called pick your poison. We have three options, A, B, or C, and I'll let you know which is which. All right, David, you're up first. A. A, all right, we're gonna go to our advice column. All right, you and I are both in the writing business. So we're gonna go to our advice column. What's the best and worst writing advice someone ever gave you? The best and the worst. Yep. Um, well, the worst advice I ever got was from one of my agents who said I should write three chapters in an outline for about 10 novels and didn't take any of them, all of which got published later. <laughs> and the best advice that I've ever gotten um, was to just write what feels right for you to write and not to try to be the next Stephen King or the next, be the first you. Well, that was the exact quote. Be the first David Neal Wilson. I know. All right. I like that one. All right, Chris, you're up next. So my choices are B and C? B and C. I'll take C, C for Chris. All right, so this is, a, this is the newest one on the show. It's a, it's a little bit of a complex one, so you gotta bear with me. All right, and this, so this one is all or nothing or steady as she goes. All right, so, all right, I'm gonna give you two options that will define the rest of your career. This is you as the, as the author. This okay. is gonna define the rest of your career and you can only pick one, but here are the two options. Option number one, your next book is an international bestseller. You win every award there is. You make tons of money. Your book gets made into a movie that wins the Academy Award for Best Picture. You can ride this success forever. You will always be that guy. Now, however, however, every book that you write after that one, I'm talking every single one, is an absolute dumpster fire critically trashed and a commercial zero. You are called a washed up hack who can no longer even string together two cohesive sentences. <laughs> or, or you keep writing as you've always done. You are generally well respected, but there's not all that much money in it. So if the two choices were up to you, which career path do you pick? All or nothing or steady as she goes? Uh, I'm going to take the George R. R. Martin and, and go with the, I'll take the big one right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I'll just, I'll just smile and smile and, and people can keep <laughs> inviting me to do things based on the one thing I got right way back when, right. even though I haven't finished that series, even though I've gotten nothing new in it, um, even though I haven't done shit, uh, <laughs> I've got that one thing and it made me a lot of money and it was really cool. All right. But you have no bitterness about Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all right fair enough all right i love it all right so john so this is it's, you're, you're going to get the last one which Be is <laughs> which is going to be the rejection letter. And we touched upon it vaguely before, but we're going to follow up on it. So author, an author will propose a novel, and unless they self-publish, which is increasingly common these days, they have to submit it to a publisher. And even some of the biggest authors ever, such as Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and others, were all initially rejected. And yet all authors, to varying degrees, struggle with rejection. So talk to me about rejection as part of the writing business. Um, well, it, it's inevitable. I, I don't. Um, I don't think anybody doesn't get rejected and hits the big time or real big success right off the bat. Um, like you said, J.K. Rowling. What did she get? Like 180 rejections or something crazy like that for uh, the Harry Potter series. Um, Can you repeat the question though, because I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm... So basically, so look, rejection is just part is, yeah. you know, all, every author deals with rejection in yeah. different, in different ways, but it's inevitably it's part of the writing business. What's, what's your take on, if you were going to tell new authors or even, you know, longstanding authors about how, how they might sort of wrap their head around getting rejected or the rejection part of the writing business? Yeah, you, you, know, you just use um you know use it as a stepping stone forward um <clears throat> now one person's poison is another person's gold when it comes to rejections you know it might it might be a great story and you're getting rejected and someone else may love it um or if uh, you get multiple rejections reassess what you've done go over it get uh, opinions on it you know not every opinion is the you know is 
you know, gold, but um, just use it constructively and you'll get there. Um, rejection, you, you've got to, you, you got to be able to handle it. All right. Fair enough. All right. So that was great. We've still got a couple of minutes and we're going to go just a little bit longer because we had a couple of technical glitches. Um, so let's take some questions from the audience. And I got a couple here. Um, do, 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 do. All right. So do you guys and whoever feels it's appropriate, do you use convention program ads at all? Do you find them, uh, do you find them effective at all? And the same goes for podcast ads, blogs, blogs and lit sites. I, can I answer this? Sure. Well, seeing it's one of my authors that asked the question, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will going forward with you. No, um, I have used convention ads and um, yes, they are. They, they do seem to help, especially at the convention. Um, but um, I'd say that they, they're short lived, you know, something, I think something more wide reaching would be better, but um but I think they're good. Chris? And seeing I, Eric is also a great um, designer. I'll have him design the ads. <laughs> I, I don't typically do a lot of convention ads. Um, I will if, you know, the convention's like, well, hey, you know, we, we really need help. Okay, I'll, I'll do one. Um, but they don't, they don't have a, a great reach. I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to talk to everybody there at the convention anyway. Um, so that doesn't do a whole lot for me. Uh, as far as podcast ads, I don't, um, I don't do podcast ads really either, but I do sponsor a podcast. Um, so yeah, I, I do get the message out there with the podcast. All right. Fair enough. And what about, uh, David, anything you want to add there? Um, we have to be really careful with advertising because the, the biggest part of our model, the thing that has pretty much set us apart from the start was that we pay almost all the money we make to the authors. So our overhead for things like that is low and we have to gauge from experience whether it's actually going to sell anything or not. But I think John hit it on the head. If you're going to be at a convention, if not a, a convention book ad, you can, you can put flyers out or you can come up with something to give away at the, at the convention Something with a QR swag. code, something Lots on of swag. Buy stuff. Yeah. There you go. All right. Let's see what else. All right. So here's one. Um, and we, we, last year I did a, I did a whole section on this every show, but I'm mixing things up. So what are your thoughts about, <laughs> it's one of my favorite questions. What are your thoughts about reviews, the importance of them and how to get, and how to get them? Chris, we'll, we'll, we'll okay. keep on with you. Sure. Um, I think they are very important. Um, there are people that say that, uh, you know, some, some of Amazon's algorithm is based on them. Uh, there are some people that say it's not. I, I think that there is a tie um, at certain levels. Um, so I think it is important to get them. Um, for every book that we launch, we do a, a review team where I'll send it out to uh, 25, 30 people before the uh, book releases. Um, and, and that way on the first weekend, you know, we've got um, 20 or so reviews for that book. I think it gives it a great jump. Um, it, you know, then when people are looking at it, they're able to see what, you know, other readers thought about it. Um, and, and hopefully all of those, re all, all of those reviews are going to be good ones since they're folks that, that like that genre. Okay. Uh, David? I have a little bit more of the negative side of that too, though. Um... We, we've done net galley for the last couple of years here. We're probably not going to do it again after this year, I don't think. But, um, you know, you, you get something like one, one person has a trigger that set them off. And uh, we had a book a couple of years ago by um, one of our authors that got hit by somebody that didn't like one of the jokes that the character made in the book, even though he was a snarky jerk. And it would be something he would say. And all of a sudden there were like 15, 20 two star reviews by people that clearly didn't have the book long enough to have even read it. Right. That can kill sales immediately. Right. But, but the way the way that I'm doing it, you know, we have people yeah, that are homegrown from our audience. They're not, you know, people that are just random folks that may or may not appreciate, you know, the book, the story, the genre. You know, you're, you're sending it out in front of people that, you know, are, are less, less forgiving, probably. Yeah. John, I, I don't mind honest reviews. It's just I, oh no, I want our I want our <laughs> folks to be honest. Yeah. Um, but you know, typically if if they're you know, for some reason, not every book is for every person. And you know, the folks that are like, yeah, 
I, I think I'm going to pass on this one, you know, and move on. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, personally, um, you know, reviews definitely can help the sale of a book. Um, but I, you know, myself, and I say this to any author out there, is that don't let it, you know, take residence in your head. Um, you know, my, like my book that they published, anywhere, there was one review that was utter garbage is what the review was. And um, I, I did what uh, uh, Jeff Strand and uh, Chris just did it with his new book. Uh, whenever he gets a, a bad review like that, you know, he makes light of it and he usually finds something humorous about it and he, uh, he'll post it online. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it should be looked at. It's, um, you know, not everybody likes the same, uh, you know, the same thing. So some people are going to love it. Some people are going to, you know, so don't, you can't take it to heart. All right. um, but, but, you know, if you see a book that has 2000 reviews and they're all, you know, in the average is four stars, yeah, it's probably going to be a pretty good damn read and it, it is going to interest me. All right. So guys, we're going to got a couple more minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we're going to see what, uh, what we have here just to, for the folks at home. So can you guys all to see this here? Yes. All right. I can see That's a great darn book. All right, Chris. So, so what, what do we got here? That is uh, science fiction with aliens. Um, it is uh, near sci-fi, near-term sci-fi. Um, aliens come down, you know, we make contact and uh, they need to get somewhere, but they need somebody to help and we help. Uh, that is the first book uh, of a trilogy. Um, I finished it. I was like, hooray, I'm done. Uh, and the reader said, no. Uh, we want to know more. We want it to be a trilogy of trilogies, uh, like Star Wars, only better. So that series is Star Wars, only better. Star Wars, only better. All right. Fair enough. All That's right. Fair. All right. So, uh, John, what do we got here? Well, that um, I, I put that one especially because uh, Dave published it and I wrote it. And um, I, I give kudos to Dave Dodd also for knocking it out of the park with the cover, which I think definitely helped sales as well. Uh, I got Stoker nominated and it won the Drunken Druid Award in Ireland, which, uh, you know, for a Scottish Irish writer, that was kind of nice. Um, it's a paranormal fantasy. It deals with uh, child abuse and, um, and about two sisters who witnessed the murder of their mother and take um, dissociation to a new level. Um, you know, I, I, so it's, so it's a feel good book. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, uh, or as that woman in UK said, utter garbage. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Wow. Sounds creepy. All right. Been very well. All right. Great. And David, what do we got? Well, real quick. I just want to say that I love the audio book of John's book. I recommend that to anybody. Oh, Mary this, did a great job on it too. Great. This book, this book here, Jurassic Ark, I'm going to, probably going to change up the cover because I think it's a little misleading. Um, there are a lot of dinosaurs in it, but some of the reviewers seem confused because I didn't call them T-Rexes and, and names that they wouldn't have used back in biblical times. Um, this started as a joke from the creationist point of view. You know, 6,000 years ago, there's men, there's dinosaurs, and there's a crazy guy building a boat. And then it turned into a book where I realized that there's a lot of moral problems with being the only family who's going to survive and all the people who are helping you, people you've known hundreds of years in some cases are all just going to be blown away in a flood. So it turned into a lot more than just that great review in Publishers Weekly, great reviews everywhere. No one's buying it. And I think well, they think it's a dinosaur book. Well, hopefully we can change that here with a little yeah. boost here. All right, guys, thanks. And uh, as for me, uh, if you're up for a little sci-fi with your private eye fiction, I'll encourage you to check out my sci-fi noir, Fractured Lives, the second book in my ongoing series featuring hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick. It's part Doctor Who, part Blade Runner, part Philip Marlowe. As the core mystery, Hardwick and her protege, Eric Whistler, are hired to find out if a galaxy design savant is suffering from a nervous breakdown or is the victim of an urban, the urban legend known as the Scarlet Raj. 
who may or may not have nefarious plans of her own. But on a more personal note, Hardwick is struggling to decide how or if she can be an effective private eye and be a good mother to her five-year-old son, Owen. It's a grueling process for Hardwick who may have to make some tough choices. Fractured Live, this is available on Amazon and published by Crazy 8 Press. And if you want a signed copy, you can order one directly from me. All right, folks, uh, that's our show. I want to thank our guests, uh, John and David and Chris, for coming on board. I had a great time, and I want to thank everyone who's watching at home. I'm your host, Russ Colchamiro, and I'll see you all next week. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you Russ. All, all right. right. Thanks a lot, guys. Great talk. Good evening, Chris. Thanks, Dave. Take care. All right. Take care now, guys. It was great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye now.